Can I ask folks to take their seats, please? Thank you. My name is Danny Seabright. I'm the president of the US UAE Business Council, and we could not be more delighted to have all of you here today. We are here uh, for the council's panel on accessing knowledge in a digitally connected world. Uh, we're really pleased to be joined virtually in that regard. Uh, and in person by so many friends and colleagues, including those from uh, NYU Abu Dhabi, uh, the American University of Sharjah, and other distinguished educational institutions within the UAE. In these times of COVID, uh, we had to keep the, the guest list to uh, uh, 80 people. Uh, that's the limit that the Dubai authorities uh, and the Expo authorities have uh, to, for safety and precaution. But we are in a hybrid uh, uh, format. We will be re recording and taping all of this on Zoom and then posting it on YouTube later on so that others can enjoy uh, the event that we're not able to be here today. Today's panel coincides with Expo's uh, 2020's Knowledge and Learning Theme Week. The Business Council has organized business roundtable events for each one of the 10 theme weeks that Expo has uh, produced or put on the schedule. And we're, I'm really relieved to say, uh, after the last three months, Bob, that we're now halfway through. This is number five uh, of 10. And so we're, we're, we're at, as, the, as we would say in the Middle East, we're on, we're on hump day. So I'm, uh, I'm very, very pleased about that. And, and we've had five very, very successful events, including a sixth one that we have done have done with Israel and the US and the UAE, a trilateral event with the Minister of Energy from Israel. We're going to do a trilateral event with the Minister of Health uh, from Israel later in uh, January, and we're looking forward to doing a trilateral event with the Minister of, uh, of, of um, Food and Water from Israel later in February. We also have five U.S. UAE events scheduled for the last three months of Expo, January, February, and March. So we have been taking very full advantage of the U.S. pavilion here at Expo 2020 to try to showcase American innovation uh, to the rest of the world to try to showcase best-in-class American companies and businesses that are focused on American innovation. Today's panel includes a keynote address from the Vice Chancellor of Marriott Westerman of New York University, Abu Dhabi. Uh, the Business Council is proud to count NYU Abu Dhabi as one of our founding members, and given all of the great work that NYUAD does and their commitment to enhancing the Abu Dhabi ecosystem, we're really, really pr proud of that. We also have NYU Abu Dhabi's Chancellor and head of the whole system visiting as well. Andy, stand up and take a bow, please. Thank you. So we're, so we're, we're, very, we're equally and doubly and triply blessed today with, with senior officials from NYU, and we, we appreciate it very much. In addition to Marriott uh, and Andy, we are joined by distinguished panelists from Google, IBM, Speartip, Palantir, and world-class scholars. And with all deference to NYU, I have a feeling that some of you are in the room uh, to be in front of these amazing American uh, tech companies uh, to talk about possible jobs for the future and things like that, right? So uh, we're really, really, it's really wonderful to have these companies here joining us today. Our panelists represent many different facets of industry, and together we hope to paint a very comprehensive picture of how business is innovating to enable access to knowledge and support global learning. Before we uh, begin our panel discussion and hear our keynote address from Marriott, I'd like to ask Bob Clark, the U.S. Commissioner General at Expo 2020, to come to the stage to provide a few remarks. So if we can get through a few wel welcoming remarks, and please, B Bob has been a star and a scholar partner, then we'll start lunch, and then we'll have our panel discussion uh, at, uh, during lunch, if that's okay. Bob, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll be very brief because I, I know you have food sitting in front of you and you made your way to the pavilion. So life, liberty, and the pursuit of the future, the United States of America's theme, uh, we're proud to present here at the pavilion. And uh, we have had a great run so far. We've had about 450,000 people come through the pavilion. We've had about 3,500 business people at events that have been full house. People are really ready to get back together again post-COVID or uh, maybe not quite even post-COVID yet, but people are being careful. I feel safe here at the pavilion and in the expo. I think the UAE has done an amazing job with this expo, and uh, it is really the global platform for all 192 countries that are here, and it's been an amazing experience representing the country. 
I think um, you're participating in an event that Danny Seabright put together that has been remarkable. These five events have been packed houses. There's been unbelievable amount of uh, participation of great business people getting together, doing business, and that's what we're trying to do here at the pavilion. I'm sure the next five will be as successful as the first five, so I do want to just kudos to Danny Seabright, who's got an amazing program at the US UAE <laughs> Council. So with that, let's get started. Let's, let's have lunch, and I hope I get to meet every one of you before you get out of here today. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Um, the, the U.S. Consul General, Megan Gregonis, just arrived. Megan, stand up just so we acknowledge. Thank you. And as, and as Bob said, let's have lunch, uh, and then we'll bring uh, Marriott up uh, to, to make her keynote opening remarks. Thank you. Please enjoy your meal. The UAE had a very, very momentous celebration this week, and along with Expo 2020, which, is, which it turned out to be part of the same year of their, the Golden Jubilee of, of 50, let's have a round of applause for the UAE being 50 years old. I have to tell you, I've surveyed uh, most of my American companies here over, over 100 meetings I've had in uh, the last three months since I started traveling again uh, during COVID here at the end of August and early September. And every single one of my American companies has said to me how fortunate and privileged they were to be in the UAE during COVID with their families and their workers because of how safe and secure it was. Uh, how the, the response. The, the, the uh, ability to take care of every single person here, whether a citizen or an expat uh, worker, everyone was treated equally. And this is truly very, very unique, not only in the Middle East region, but in the world. So, so uh, again, hats off to the UAE for the way they've responded to COVID, for the way they have uh, executed on this amazing expo. And we could not be more proud to have uh, U.S. companies again here today uh, a, a exhibiting such amazing innovation in, in today's world. Uh, NYU University, uh, I started working with some 10 years ago with their previous chancellor, Dr. Dr. Sexton, and uh, before Andy, uh, a Andy Hamilton. And Dr. Sexton uh, convinced the crown prince that in Abu Dhabi that the UAE needed uh, a world-class uh, American university uh, to come set up shop in the region and promote uh, the sorts of um, values that America stands for, the sorts of education that we provide for the future, uh, to create those partnerships and those collaborations that are going to be so essential for the global world that we live in. Now, you know, Abu Dhabi is a little bit more conservative than Dubai, and you know, you could go to just about anywhere in the U.S. and find a, a, a university that was a little bit more conservative or middle of the road than New York University. <laughs> I mean, New York University is in the center of New York. It's one of the most progressive universities in the world. And Abu Dhabi chose New York University to come to Abu Dhabi and set up New York University Abu Dhabi. That speaks volumes. It speaks volumes for what's happened with the Abrahamic, Abrahamic House in the last few uh, years and the way the Emiratis have treated transparency and openness of religion. It, speak vo it speaks volumes for what happened with the Abraham Accords just in the last 18 months uh, with the way they have... Uh, uh, moved to change the relationship with Israel and the region. Um, in our digital age, we have unimaginable amounts of information at our fingertips. While this opens up incredible possibilities, we are also faced with information overload. It can be very difficult, as we all know from watching the movies and TV, to separate fact from fiction. I argue with the Minister of a Artificial Intelligence here all the time, Minister Al-Alama, that uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is going to come, and there's going to be a Terminator, and we're all going to be plugged into AI, and, 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 and how's that going to work? And he, he says that he's been made the minister of AI to prevent those sorts of things so that they don't happen and that we use AI most efficiently and uh, proficiently to, pr to promote and improve people's lives. So if I could invite uh, Marriott Westerman uh, to the stage. She's served, as I said, as the vice chancellor of NYU Abu Dhabi since 2019. And in this capacity, Marriott is the chief executive officer for the university and its campus. Marriott oversees all academic, administrative, and operational affairs at NYU Abu Dhabi. One, one data point, and give me the numbers, Andy, Marriott, that is so most impressive to me 
How many Rhodes Scholars have come out of uh, NYU Abu Dhabi just in the last few years? 17 Rhodes Scholars just in the last few years. What American university, what university can say that? Uh, Marriott, I think that in itself is a great way to introduce you and, and congratulate you for all the wonderful things NYU Abu Dhabi is doing. I know you're going to give some other facts that are also important about what NYU does. Thank you, Marriott. Thanks so much, Danny. Thank you, Danny, and thank you, Bob, for hosting us here at the wonderful USA Pavilion. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Please keep enjoying your lunch. Um, Danny just st stole my most important line, maybe. <laughs> no, 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 there's much more really good stuff to come. Thank you so much for your generosity, Danny, in having us. It is really such a great pleasure to speak here about our topic, the, the theme of the week, which the pavilion is interpreting as knowledge and connectivity, and the question of how we together can harness and develop knowledge and prepare for the future. And when I think about that question, of course, I think in the first place about students and in the first place about research and how those two things connect. The topic is so dear to my heart and ever present to my mind as New York University Abu Dhabi, as you just heard, exists to produce leaders and knowledge for a more adaptable and brighter future. And I think it's very apt for this event to be organized by the US UAE Business Council which does such an incredible job connecting all of us American organizations to businesses, companies, and, and universities on the ground. So thanks again to them. Now, higher education in the United States has long been one of the most effective and efficient knowledge producers in the world. It continues to be. It is also one of America's most beloved exports although we don't often think about it that way. For decades now, the US has been the most popular destination for international students, by some great measure, actually. More than a million students come every year to the United States to enroll in our universities and colleges. And the reason we're so popular, I think one reason is that roughly half of all the top 50 universities in the world that we have these rankings, and if you compare them, there are a number of them that are very credible, roughly half of the top 50 are based in the United States, including NYU itself, at about 25. Now, the system of higher education in America, many of you have gone through it, or have had exposure to it, or want to send your kids to it, and we're always happy to talk to you. Um, the system is large, it is deep, and it is diverse across these 50 states and places like here where we also operate. And at all levels of that system, from community colleges to the top tier research universities like NYU, this system puts a premium on exposing students to great teachers. They really care about teaching and to researchers. They emphasize transformative ideas and transferable, transferable skills. Universities are also crucial research partners. You all know that from your uh, organizations. Uh, they are so for the US government and for industries. Just a few data points. In 2019, so this is the pre-pandemic year, US universities together spent about $85 billion on research. $85 billion. If American universities together were a country, they would be the sixth highest research spender in the world. After the US itself, there's of course research in other places, so the US spends more than 600 billion. After the US, China, Germany, Japan, and Korea, US universities would be six in the world uh, if they were a country. And I personally know the magnetic attraction of American universities because I went to the US from the Netherlands for a great college experience. It wasn't at NYU, but that's okay, it was at Williams. <laughs> Decades later, I came from the US to the United Arab Emirates to help establish NYU Abu Dhabi, this American-style university that is now, I'm happy to say, an anchor institution at 11 years young for the United Arab Emirates. The US pavilion that we're in tells a great story 
of some of the values that have propelled the success of American universities for a very long time. Freedom of worship, freedom of ideas, a history of immigration, a history of creativity, a history of openness to different abilities. You'll see that here in the pavilion. Fresh ideas, and especially to the people who bring them from all corners of the world. Now, NYU Abu Dhabi, as a university within NYU, a campus, a university, and a school, was given an extraordinary opportunity, as Danny has said, to turn what was a big dream for Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed and then President John Sexton to turn a big dream into a reality. We opened our, door, our doors in 2010 to about 140 students from 35 countries. And we are now thriving with 1,800 undergraduate students and 125 graduate students from almost 120 countries who speak about 120 languages. We select our students very carefully. Only, that's where those Rhodes Scholars come from in the end, right? Only 4%, I'm sorry to say this, but it's just a reality, only 4% of our applicants is admitted. Our 330 or so professors we have for our 1,900 students add value to our students' incredible raw talent. They do so in small classes, they do so in research projects, community engagement activities, and creative productions across all disciplines, STEM disciplines, social science, the humanities, and the arts. This is a data point that I think employers always like to hear, and I certainly like to say it. Upon graduation, 95% of our students, upon graduation, 95% of our students are placed in all sorts of wonderful positions across these fields of human endeavor, here or abroad, 40% here in the UAE. Or they have entered, the smaller number has entered graduate programs, the most distinguished in the world, at Harvard, at Princeton, at Stanford, at NYU, at Oxford, at Cambridge, at Tsinghua University, at Sciences Po in Paris, and well beyond. And yes, we just had that 17 student chosen as a Rhodes Scholar. And I can go on and on, but I won't, about the incredible achievements of our students. I want to stop at our first Rhodes Scholar, probably known to quite a few of you. She is Shama al Masrui, Her Excellency Shama al Masrui, who upon her return uh, from her Rhodes Scholarship in Public Policy at Oxford, became the UAE's Minister of State for Youth, and at the time, the youngest minister on earth ever appointed. I'm an art historian. I just want to say she also took art history with me. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> now, I know that many of you as employers are curious because you've been asking me about the effect of the pandemic on the students, this generation who were so incredibly rudely disrupted. It, we thought we were disrupted as adults, think or have a heart for students. And what have they experienced and what does the world look like to them now coming onto the job market? I would say that NYU and really almost all universities around the world have distinguished themselves in their ability to innovate so that their students could continue to learn and to continue, and, and that our universities also could continue to produce research. We produce students, we produce knowledge. Those are the two main things we do after all. So a few data points there. Between March and April 2020, most universities I'm aware of took every single one of their courses online within, 20, within, within two weeks when many professors had never had to teach or wanted to teach online. They did so successfully. It wasn't perfect. There's no perfect in pandemic. We know that. But most students expressed satisfaction across the board with how their university stood with them. The next year, just as NYU did and, and where Abu Dhabi did, we saw record numbers of applications from students. What was the number, Andy? What did we break in New York? 100,000 applica ap applicants for undergraduate education last year alone. Also in 2020, NYU had one of its most successful and productive research years of all time. We didn't stop thinking, we didn't stop writing, we didn't stop running experiments. 
And I want to say NYU was really not an exception in this, although we did very well. And of course, the story that we all know of the astonishing COVID vaccine development, not just one vaccine, but about a dozen of them in one year's time or less, is ultimately the story of decades of investment in basic scientific research and medical research in universities. Without that, we wouldn't have had those wonderful mRNA vaccines, for example. Back to the students, because they are the employers, the, the employees you're going to be looking for, I think. Survey data for students, university students in many countries confirm that students were not dissatisfied with the education that we helped create for them the past year and a half. While they, of course, came to university go to go to school in person, and that's what we all want, as most people do, they say that they would opt for online learning again if there is no other option. They see a role for it in their education, even if they're in person. What students are telling us, and this is very relevant to all of your ro roles as employees, employers, they want universities to prepare them with laser focus for changing job markets, the, nat the new nature of work to come. And they want our universities, and and we Abu Dhabi in particular, to prepare them to address severe global problems like global warming, health crises, and inequality of all sorts. These problems haven't gone away because of the pandemic, on the contrary. So the question I will end with is this one. How can these student demands, we are hearing from our students around the world and at NWI Abu Dhabi, how can they be matched to the needs of the knowledge-based economy? How can we prepare them best for your enterprises? You, of course, have given us some help here because as employers, you've shown that remote work or hybrid work is possible and that these hybrid solutions are likely to remain part of workplace culture, especially now that we've got the four and a half day week coming here in Abu Dhabi and the UAE. Even so, hybrid will be here I think many jobs, we know this, require this kind of activity, this liveliness that we have around these lunch tables, in-person teamwork, sociability, and contact for our organizations to thrive. But here is some there are some extremely interesting data points. Dramatically, I think, most employers in various surveys are reporting that 40% or more of, em of workers will require reskilling now for up to six months to deal with the new realities of the workplace. And even more stunning, 94% of businesses, including all of you, 94% <laughs> of you, expect employees to be learning new skills on the job. Please be patient with universities. We cannot train every student for every last eventuality that you will have to have them encounter in your organizations. But that 94% number of skilled learners on the job, that was only 65% in 2018. So there's a real realization in the workplace now. Universities like NYU and NYU Abu Dhabi are responding to these realities by doing more intentionally what we always have done. We learned that to this day, employers value the analytical skills and the expertise that graduates bring in various fields. But they also want universities to educate for the leadership skills that you need now. And these skills, I would say, are not about technical expertise primarily. They are more like habits of mind, best practices that you talk about, critical thinking, the ability to deal with large amounts of data, problem solving, also, these kind of mental habits and, and practices of self-management, emotional abilities, including active learning on the job, resilience, stress tolerance, so much has been asked of us, adaptability, interpersonal skills like openness, creativity, collaboration across difference, empathy and communication. Most people aren't born with these. Your universities are helping students get there. And so at NYU Abu Dhabi, we educate to meet this generation of students, this very particular generation of students, where they are, and we educate them for adaptable, successful careers, for societal contributions, 
and for purposeful lives to them and their families. And those three things, purpose, societal contribution, and also adaptability, they go along with each other. And a successful career, you can't separate them. So our students seek and acquire depth in a major field, breadth in intercultural perspective from all these students, from all these countries they're with, and experience, real experience in research. And they emerge on the other end with the skills required to, addre to address the pursuit of equality, of sustainability, of prosperity, of peace, of health. And also, I would say for our students, a profound understanding of humanity and what humanity needs to do now to pull together to create a better world for all. I'm happy to say to that we are doing this in the UAE because our global and local model of education mirrors, as you know, the UAE's incredible global demography and its outlook, its forward-looking outlook to the, to the next 50 years. We bring our wide-ranging perspectives as professors into the classroom and the lab. The students bring it into their learning and their research. And I want to say proudly that our university is not an ivory tower. Most universities are not, by the way, but ours definitely is not. We are very porous to this country. We are more of a, the tower is the wrong metaphor, we are more of a souk, a souk of ideas. Our campus even looks like one. I welcome you to come. We partner with employers in research partnerships. Talk to us if you're interested in that. And we give you access to some of the most extraordinary talent in the world with all the value add that they acquire in their educations. These, these students who bring their whole selves and their experiences into your organizations as interns and as employees. I want to end by saying that there are no great societies without flourishing universities. And we are very proud to be an example of that symbiotic ecosystem between knowledge organizations, education organizations, and a society in the UAE. And we really look forward to having further opportunities to bring the best of US education and research to this country and to your businesses. So with that, I wanna thank you all for your attention and thank you, Danny, again. And I look forward very much to hearing from our esteemed panelists from industry. Thank you. Well, Mary, uh, you certainly set the stage for the discussion that's going to follow with, with industry. Uh, and I'll ask my industry colleagues to come up now, please. And I'll ask them to sort of factor in or, or, or fold into their comments um, a few thoughts about what the challenges that Mary has uh, outlined for everyone, because I think it's really, really important. So please, everyone, come on up. We'll get started. Um, I want to also say that as this is the World Expo and the U.S. Pavilion is being a, trying to be a showcase for the global community. We have reps in the room from Poland, Croatia, Malaysia, Colombia, the UAE, Serbia, Mexico, and New Zealand. Did I miss a country that's here? Which one? Namibia. Namibia. And I've been to Namibia. It's a beautiful country. Thank you. So, so uh, again, the purpose of... And Dominican, I've been to Dominican Republic, another beautiful country. <laughs> Just on vacation there two years ago before COVID. So uh, in the spirit of this pavilion's purpose, which is to showcase American innovation to all of the world and to look for areas of collaboration in the future, that's what we hope to talk about a little bit in this ne next few minutes, if, if we could. So let me introduce... Uh, uh, me? Oh, who are we missing? No, I think just move over, guys. We're all here. Tim's up here? Yeah, just move up, move down one. Where, where's Salim? Salim. I was going to say thank you. Salim, Salim needs a special invitation to come to the stage. Salim Eddie from Google. <laughs> when, when you're from a company called uh, Google that's also Alphabet that has a subsidiary for every letter in the alphabet, I guess you get a little confused sometime of where you're supposed to be, so. <laughs> and an ex-IBMer. So, so uh, I'm gonna make sure I have the, the list here right in front of me. We have, uh, 
from my, from my, from my right to left, we have uh, Phil Noble, the founder of World Class Scholars. And, and then we have Hossein Self El Din, the general manager of IBM Middle East and Pakistan. We have the infamous Salim Eddy from Google. Uh, we have, uh, 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 I'm sorry, Sid, uh, De I always say Dayal wrong. Sid Dayal, who's the deployment strategist for the UAE uh, for Palantir, a very innovative and interesting company uh, that's been wor doing work here in the UAE for quite some time now. And Tim Rubelet, the principal consultant at Speartip, an, a, a very interesting cyber company uh, from the United States. So let's just jump right in, given the time that we have left. We have about 45, 50 minutes, and I want to leave uh, time for a question or two. Uh, Celine, Google's stated mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally ac accessible and useful. It does so through well-known tools such as, your, such as your search engine, your calendar, and Google Maps, tools that we all use in the world today. Take us a little deeper into this mission statement, Celine. How does Google ensure the, that the information it provides is truly useful, and how does it help combat misinformation to promote the purest forms of knowledge? Two minutes or less, Celine, please. Uh, purest uh, form of knowledge, you said, right? In less yes. than two minutes. I think we, I leave this one to the to the academics uh, in, in the room. Uh, at Google, we say we there is an expression that's very common. We say. Um, especially with engineers and execs, we say we do stuff, we do simple things. Like uh, you have a question to ask, you go on search, you ask it. You have an opinion to voice, you don't need to go to the a TV network, you just put something in your living room, uh, you film it and you post it on YouTube. You're lost in a city going from point A to point B map. And uh, <coughs> so these are simple things, but they've been so simple and uh, easy to use that um, uh, so many people are using them today, um, and I think in the uh, um, in the mission statement it says accessible, uh, universally accessible. So scaling, the word scaling is extremely important. They were so simple and easy to use that they scale. Uh, just to give you an idea, we have like uh, I think nine products, each one being used by one billion person every day. So we're talking about scaling, massive scale, which actually enriches the experience because you have a 360 degree uh, uh, feed into the uh, information. <coughs> so that's, uh, uh, that's how it, uh, it's been so far. What's new now is that uh, after coming up to simple things that scale, that really scale at, at, uh, at the planet uh, uh, size wise, uh, now we are personalizing it through uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And of course, it's the user's choice. We give the control to the user whether uh, the, the user wants to, to have the information or the service personalized to, to his or her uh, needs. Uh, so that's more or less uh, the sort of the formula, if I may say so. But uh, if I look at the UAE, for instance, uh, those products I just mentioned, we, we ran before prior to COVID, a research and the economic impact, because we can talk about uh, things, what really matters is the impact, what difference you make. And uh, it turns out that an independent study uh, by Public First in the UK shows that the contribution, economic contribution benefits to the UAE is of the magnitude of, was in 2019, of the magnitude of 3 billion US dollars, uh, approximately saving uh, one week per year per person uh, in terms of facilitating things. Now that we're working less, uh, we probably have to but do another But Salim, Google replicates that around the world, not just yes. in the UAE, correct? I mean, yes, but, but, but just to give an idea about the scale. The scale. Right? The scale. That's in the past, but the future now with COVID and the digital that helped us all keep our universities open, keep our uh, doctors speaking to, to their patients and keep the goods flowing from small, medium-sized enterprises, large enterprises to clients, things are, are changing. And we expect uh, that uh, across emerging markets, uh, which include Latin America, I see there is a representation from Latin America, and, uh, uh, and Africa and uh, the Middle East and, and uh, North Africa, uh, we're, we're talking, um, we, we run a, a research to identify countries that are what we call digital sprinters, meaning 
uh, growth market, they have this opportunity to, to embrace even further and more uh, uh, the technological change and, and reap the benefits. And we try to measure it, to not measure it, as you all know, we don't go very far in the discussion. And just as an illustration for the UAE again, um, we, we're talking about uh, economics benefits of the magnitude of $280 billion by 2030. For emerging markets, I have just mentioned before, it's $3.4 trillion only for 16 countries. On average, 25% of a, G a GDP of uh, 2020 uh, for each country. This is the benefit they could reap, but it's not unconditional. On the condition that they actually do uh, 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 things and stuff like digital policies right, they get them right and all that. Concerning the misinformation. We have to move, so. Yes. So, uh, so Google search is not, yeah, yes, so I'll, I'll, uh, Google uh, uh, search is not an oracle of truth, it's a search engine, it surfaces what is out there, right? And we have, uh, we have means and ways to actually uh, remove stuff that doesn't, uh, is not uh, appropriate, is not, is not good. For instance, just to give you an idea, uh, YouTube, um, you have 500 hours per minute of uploading videos. So since I started talking maybe two minutes ago, you had a thousand, uh, yeah, five minutes, <laughs> 2,500 uh, hours of, of, of YouTube. But uh, what's really interesting is that we take down a lot of this, this stuff using AI and ML and uh, at the rate of 50 per, per minute. Uh, no one sees them because they are totally inappropriate. We raise, like in COVID, we, we made sure that only the right information is, is displayed out there. We partnered with ministries of health to have authoritative uh, information, relevant and accurate information. I'll stop there. Thank you, thank you. And that your term digital sprinters is really interesting and helpful. Uh, I noticed that there's a number of African countries that are uh, becoming digital sprinters, and this is really hopeful for the future as well. I'm, I'm going to turn, Sid, I'm going to turn to Hassam and come back to you next. Um, Hassam, IBM has been a pioneer in the use of AI, artificial intelligence, and its applications to business. Watson is, of course, a global brand name. Has AI lived up to its promise to help us ex access knowledge and assimilate it and manage it and move it around? In what ways has it succeeded and in what ways has it not achieved its potential? And then maybe just the crystal ball, what's next in the next few years on AI from Should your I standpoint? Should I do it in two minutes and a half? My two minutes and a half or Celine's two minutes and uh, a half? Well, be, be kind to your follow-on uh, <laughs> panelists so they, they each get two minutes, please. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you, Danny, and thank you, everyone. Uh, so uh, AI uh, is, uh, in my personal opinion, and uh, I, will, uh, I will go into some data, data now, but uh, we are heading in the right, uh, in the right uh, direction, but it's still far away from where uh, we can utilize the AI. What, what is happening is more of experimental. Organization and enterprises are experimenting uh, AI. And uh, I'll go through some data points now to tell you how, how this is affecting the industry in general. But reality is we are heading in the right direction. Uh, organization are embracing AI and COVID had accelerated the adoption of technology in general. So we cannot have a business discussion without hearing certain words like uh, cloud computing, like uh, hybrid cloud, like uh, uh, IoT or um, uh, Internet of Things or 5G that is coming or being deployed in certain areas including the UAE or edge computing. So there are many things, those buzzwords are no longer buzzwo buzzwords, but really things that our enterprises and clients are trying to uh, establish in the, in the industry. And let me give you some data points because it's important for you to understand the impact of AI on business from, a, from, a, uh, from, from an enterprise perspective. So take, for instance, a virtual agent technology, which is a call center. We all... Uh, use the call center to call for uh, credit cards or for telephone bills or for anything. Data, this is real data out of uh, IBM uh, uh, surveys with real clients. So customer satisfaction plus 8%. When infusing AI, this is the result that you get, plus 8% customer satisfaction. Revenue plus 3%. The stock market, by the way, moves on one point. So this is plus 3%. Human agent satisfaction, the agent himself that being offloaded with certain things because of the AI is plus 
first contract resolution plus 10 percent. Those are real data from real uh, environments. And in reality, you, in my opinion, you cannot have the discussion of AI without having the discussion of the cloud. And, uh, and from IBM perspective, hybrid cloud is the way forward and everything is going to be hybrid. And for that, like the students, by the way, we need to ensure that their foundation is up to a certain level. Any enterprise now require that the foundation or the architecture need to be a bit of an open architecture because the reality is things are complex and I will link that to skills now. The complexity of the technologies, how you integrate them together, require that we build from an enterprise perspective or from client's perspective, we build an architecture that is open, that is capable for today and for the future as well. What, to does, hy what does hybrid mean in that, in that situation? Sorry? What does hybrid mean? Hybrid, hybrid mean uh, that you can have private and public cloud. On, that the the same, word, on the same system. That the word, yeah, that the word is not only public cloud. The word is, and by the way, this is something that organizations are endorsing, which is private and, uh, uh, and, and, and public. So because of regulatories, because of uh, data laws, you need always to keep certain things in-house, and you need to have certain things make sense to have it on the cloud. That hybrid notion is not on a single cloud, but it can be multiple clouds the complexity of how you manage it, how you operate it, how you move workload from one place to the other. Now, the challenge that organization is facing is really that for you to, for any enterprise to do this, you need skills. And un, un, unfortunately, the skills is the first number one challenge. And that's why the education system, right? The enablement of, uh, of youth uh, coming up with ideas is, is critical. And I think this would be helpful for our second part of the, of the discussion. The other thing I just want to mention before we move from that point is that, uh, like, we, like I was saying on the foundation from, the, from, from a student perspective, from we, we as an employer, right, would like when, have, um, when we have students or people joining uh, uh, companies or enterprises, they understand the basics. And some of those basics, like you cannot have AI without uh, an IA, information architecture. Y you need to collect the data, you need to analyze it, you need to, you need to understand it. The data is everything when it comes to AI. So students need to be well informed and aware of the basics of a roadmap in order to reach an AI system and environment. So to answer your question, I think uh, in simple way, I think we are going in the right direction, but there's still lots to go, uh, lots, lots to do in the sense of uh, uh, the business moving from uh, being experimenting to uh, expanding, being scalable, and have a, a growth mindset when it comes to AI. Because AI is a bit uh, challenging. How you trust the system, how you trust the environment that you are implementing, it sometimes can be a bit scary. So it's, it needs some guts in order to do that, but we are heading in the right direction. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, Sid, Palantir builds platforms. I've gotten to know your company very well over the last few months, Sid, and very fascinating technology company builds platforms for integrating, managing, and securing data on top of which it layers applications for fully active, interactive, human-driven, machine-assisted analysis. Um, the l analysis is only as good as the data that is inputted, as well as the technology behind the product, of course. How do we ensure that our knowledge of the world today is driven by the right data sets, Sid? Maybe it's working now. There you go. There we go. I work in technology. Um, first of all, thanks, Danny, for having us and, and um, convincing me to do a public-facing forum. He knows us very well. He knows that uh, we don't do this very often. P Palantir does not like to speak publicly very often, do they? <laughs> no, we don't. But we're getting better since we went public last year. So, um, I think since you joined the USUA Business Council, you're being forced into it, right, Sid? <laughs> MashaAllah, that's <laughs> the best decision we've made here. I, I, I mean that. Um, and thanks, uh, Bob, Matthew, well, Matthew is here, and Laurie for an amazing space. Uh, we're big fans of the pavilion here, and everyone who comes down here just, just loves their time at the expo. Uh, Eric. Um, that's a very good question, and I think uh, the short answer to that would be just, just use us, use Palantir, but that wouldn't be doing it justice to, to actually clean all the data. Um, it's interesting. 
our experience over the years, for those of you who don't know, Balanzai, we came out of uh, the lessons learned from 9-11 um, and the fact that data existed in silos between different agencies around the US uh, but was not put together to make sense of it. And we had some of the best and brightest minds working at those agencies, uh, but they were not able to secure the homeland. And, and those lessons are seared into the DNA of Balanzai. Uh, the problems now that we face and the problems that we try to fix are uniform across healthcare, um, finance, uh, Ferrari, automotive, for those of you who are at Formula One, Balanzai powers the, the Ferrari data platform. Um, and also across all national security work. But the one common thing we see uh, everywhere we go in terms of dirty data, it's, it's mindset. Uh, it boils down to the people. And it's strange coming from a product company. We build some of the best products in the world that put all that data together for you and help you make decisions. But it's the people. Uh, we have people who will talk about digital transformation and they'll go around saying that we're going to be able to change an organization by digitally transforming it. But Transformation comes from within. It needs to come from a mindset. And data lives in silos, dirty or clean, uh, irrespective. It lives in silos because people operate in silos. Uh, organizations operate in silos, be it for political reasons or for personal reasons. And that is the number one thing, actually, Danny, that we run into. Uh, and which goes back to what, what, uh, what Merit was saying, that, that we're looking, uh, when we look at people, we look uh, at hiring the best and the brightest from around the world. We uh, God knows we've got the best and brightest from around the world present, I mean, me uh, excluded. Uh, but what we do with those people is that we bring them in, we hire the smartest, and we don't tell them what to do, they tell us what to do. Um, and the one thing we realize is their ability to apply empathy, to be lifelong learners, their ability to understand an organization, understand what is an organization but a uh, emblematic nature of the humans that inhabit it. So for all the technology in the world and for all the buzzwords that, uh, that my colleague from IBM was, was talking about, none of that means anything if you don't have the right people wielding that power. And that's what comes back to clean data and dirty data. It doesn't, doesn't really matter for us. It's finding the best people to go wield that power and to be able to make sense of it. Um, back when I was growing up, we used to hear this analogy about finding a needle in the haystack. I go to countless meetings where folks expect us to find needles in haystacks. Um, and the, the, the situation right now is we're all drowning in haystacks of needles. I mean, that's, that's the simple fact of the matter. All of it makes sense, all of it looks important, and uh, whether it's your uh, organization's data or what you're seeing on your phone or all the notifications you get all day and get bombarded with, it's just too much information. And what we need at the end of the day for, uh, coming back to your question, Danny, for being able to get an organization to have clean data, it's to have people who are willing to think cross-functionally, people who are willing to think across boundaries and are willing to make... Break down the silos. Ask questions. And break down silos and ask questions. Um, and once you have those people, the products just follow. Thank you, Sid. Tim, your company, uh, first of all, you come also from a little bit of a security background, being from the U.S. Secret Service, uh, uh, and your job to protect, your company's job is to protect information, um, spear tip. But... but you know, the most important information we all have to protect today is our IP. I, our intellectual property is the name of the game. And some countries do not follow best practices when it comes to healthy competition, and it makes protection of our IP even more important uh, for the future. Um, this is a problem that affects all sectors, private, public, and academia. How can business learn from Speartip to better protect themselves uh, from having their data stolen or exposed? And what, uh, how do we ensure and we realize the ben benefits of digitization while protecting against these associated risks? Yeah, um, so SpearTip is, is a cyber forensic, cyber counterintelligence firm. And a lot of people um, don't realize that the, the technology that we have. The technology we have now to make uh, our lives much easier. Thank you. 
We're always as we're always as strong as our weakest link. Uh, so, so Phil, I'm gonna we're gonna pivot here to follow up on Marriott's wonderful keynote uh, opening uh, to, to 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 apply all this and bring it all back a little bit to education. Uh, World Class Scholars is a free online education and cultural exchange program that matches students and teachers around the world to create global classrooms, an independent program that has been in development for years. It's being launched globally as part of Expo 2020 Dubai World's Fair, and its theme is Connecting Minds, Creating the Future. Phil, can you tell the audience a little bit more about this program and how it's using technology to help kids access knowledge in a digital world, and how some of these companies at the table can help you in that process? Uh, sure. Uh, I want to first thank Danny. We are the outlier of the outliers. Uh, we, we are essentially a, a startup, but Danny has taken us under his wing and helped us and promoted us and given us a forum, and we appreciate that. That's terrific. Let me respond in a little different way. Imagine. Imagine a little boy named Amin who lives in a small town right outside of Abu Dhabi. And imagine a little girl named Maria who lived in a small town outside of Athens. They're both 12 years old. They're both kind of shy. They're both suspicious of people they don't know. They're a little afraid of the big city. But they really, really like football, and science in that order. Now imagine for the moment that their teachers said, we're going to connect to another school around the world. And Amin and Maria began to connect and, and work on a project together, a science project together. And over time, they learned about each other's culture and their country and their homes and their families, and they became friends. And imagine that when they took their science project, they then presented it. They, they shared it with others in their school. They shared it in their community. They shared it online, and they shared it with a larger world. Now imagine for a moment that those two teachers all of a sudden were given access to every educational software and tool that Microsoft has. And they give it to them for free for as long as they're in the program. Teacher training, certification, all sorts of stuff. And then imagine that that teacher got to fly business class on Etihad Airlines to Paris to go to education conferences. And imagine for a moment that Amin and Maria and a couple of their kids were selected. And Amin went to Greece, to, to Maria's class. And Maria and her teacher went to Amin's class. All expenses paid. Business class, thanks to Etihad Airlines. Do we need to put the students in business, or could they be in economy? Uh, give them. Give them business. They'll love it. 
And that's what world-class scholars is. We connect kids. And, and our friends here at Google say they want to organize the world's information. Well, we're just as outrageously ambitious. We want to connect all the world's kids. And we want to connect them in a, in, the, in a way that the young people of those schools have their lives changed because of the innate connection of kids, the innate curiosity, the innate experience of learning a world far beyond they ever imagined. And they can do it, and they can do it today, and they can do it right now, and they can do it for free through world-class scholars. And we are here as a, 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 an official participant of Expo. We are probably a factor of 10, the smallest organization at Expo. And, but we have an, a, a commissioner general, and he's sitting right there, uh, Anders Lundberg, right here. So... I would just say to you that we need to totally rethink what education is about post-COVID. And a big part of that is connecting kids to other kids around the world as an ongoing part of their education. Not an add-on, but an ongoing part of their education. And that's what we're here to do. Bill, a great round of applause to you for your effort. We appreciate it. And this is the vision of Expo and the purpose of Expo at the end of the day. So uh, a great, great, amazing effort on your part. Salim, Google's efforts to digitize education have been actually very revolutionary and universally felt. With apps like Google Classroom, where educators can directly connect with their students, and features like Google Docs and Google Drive, Google has impacted the lives of students and educators worldwide already. Tell us about the impact of these programs in two minutes or less. How can these programs be further utilized to even greater effect? What's next, Salim, please? Thank you, Danny. So um, uh, I used to work for IBM, <laughs> so you went more than five minutes. <laughs> um, uh, OK, um, so uh, thank you, Phil, for, the, for, for what you shared with us. And uh, uh, just in, in time of crisis, uh, there is a lot of suffering, and I think we all are coming out from a very, um, very deep crisis, COVID, and uh, the aftermath of it. Same time, in time of crisis, you have things that surface uh, that are good. And um, I, I, for the old timers here, I, I see Yusuf Khalili there. I used to work at Cisco. He used to work at IBM. The advocates of, of digitization, uh, somehow the revenge of the nerds, right? I mean, now, uh, during the COVID, uh, digital kept digital kept the world running uh, and platforms and cloud. Um, and most importantly for education uh, kept uh, students and teachers connected, students between students and teachers with, uh, uh, with themselves. But at the core of it, um, something, I, I'm not uh, an educator, so I'm not a specialist, but there is the battle of the seas, you know. C is for content, C is for conne connecti uh, connectivity, and C is for collaboration. And I would submit to you that connectivity and collaboration actually um, is as important, if not more important than content. And I think uh, Phil's testimony is, is quite telling. And the fact that NYU has a networked university uh, says a lot. So at the core of the Google offering, and this is your question, is uh, heavy collaboration. So if you, if, who has used a doc before, Google Docs, right? So you know you get there, and with your friends, and you build together the document, and in half an hour, it's out of the door, uh, compared to, to, to hours and, and weeks of, uh, you know, sending back and forth uh, the email. So these simple things, uh, unleashing the, the power of collaboration is important. So, so collaboration at the heart of education is extremely critical and is strategic. So, um, so that's that's really, if I may, this is this is the uh, uh, secret sauce. I, 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 what's really important is scaling. So this is something that is uh, not given enough importance. It's nice to do some boutique work. Uh, uh, you can connect a few people with some people, but to scale, you absolutely need the cloud, and to personalize, you need artificial intelligence and ML intelligence at the edge. To, to help people focus on what really matters. And Can Google help fill scale? 
Pardon? Might Google help fill scale in the future? Uh, absolutely. All right. But he has to move from Microsoft to somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> just, just kidding. Of course, Microsoft is. is My, Microsoft is also our member, so, and they do a lot of great work. So, so from we have Microsoft to, be. to IBM. And so, 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 Hosam, uh, to your point, IBM ha Education has placed an emphasis on AI, as we've said, the hybrid cloud computing and data management, uh, and better student experience. Since AI seems to be so central to all of this, uh, Salim just uh, uh, you know, mentioned it, what are you set to do in the next 10 years and how is IBM planning to expand its AI programs to advance education endeavors? So, um, so thank you, Danny. So uh, uh, as Salim was saying, I mean, uh, collaboration is important and the fact that connectivity is also important and the idea of uh, agility having uh, uh, to be able to deliver the education uh, any anytime, anywhere, at the own uh, time and pace of the students or the person that is uh, uh, taking the education. And that's why we have two major uh, programs that close to my heart, at least, that I want to share. The first, what we call IBM uh, Digital Nation, and this started in Africa, actually, uh, in order to help the youth uh, from an education perspective and this is the basics of uh, uh, digital uh, skills, just the basics. So you can think about it that it relates to students in, uh, in, in schools at a very early uh, uh, age in order to enable them about what is uh, technology all about, what's programming, what's TCP IP, which is very technical uh, term, but it takes them through the, uh, the different journey at the, fir at the first stage and then take them in a second stage into more of to play with things, to understand how to create, for instance, uh, a wallet, a payment wallet. So something that help them think about how to make, uh, to, to start up a, a business and so on at the, at the really very young uh, age. And we deployed this even in, uh, in across Middle East and Africa, even in the UAE, by the way, we did this with GEMS. And it was uh, it was announced with uh, with uh, the gems uh, uh, across gem schools, and it was uh, very well uh, perceived. So this is one program that uh, that we have, and there is certification, and there is also ability to have free uh, cloud uh, uh, account on the IBM cloud uh, uh, business, so they can actually use software tools and so on and try it. The second one is more geared to. Uh, um, universities, students in the university, faculty members, and it's called IBM Skills Academy. And this is a very famous program that we started 2015. And since then, we have uh, 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 enrolled 600 universities. We educated 70,000 students. We had also 12,000 uh, faculty members educated as part of the program. That's more covering cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, um, uh, cloud, uh, all the different technologies that we talk about, uh, uh, Internet of Things. And it takes uh, students and the faculty uh, members into the different stages, including the certification. But the most important for us is that it links that as well. Everyone that is certified from the students is linked to job opportunities when it comes to our clients, and our business partners. So we're trying to balance by creating the, uh, the knowledge base, transfer the knowledge base to the, to the students, and from there we are able to use that knowledge base into our, to help our clients and help our, uh, our business partners. And, and all this is coming under one umbrella uh, next year because we have been, we committed actually that we intend to educate 30 million people across the world uh, uh, by 2030. So this is a statement that IBM did and we are geared for it. So there is lots of activities going and as Salim said and Phil, I mean we, cloud is in the center. Universities will be also in the center. And reality is students are hungry for, no, for knowledge, hungry for, uh, for uh, getting new uh, uh, skills and, and, uh, and, and, and add it to their portfolio. So we look forward to participate by the way and to collaborate with all of you whoever wants to uh, know more, and uh, I'm happy uh, to share that uh, in, in further discussion. Awesome, thank you very much. Sid, um, you were very specific about what makes Palantir successful, uh, you know, your people. Give us 
let's take the let's put the rubber to the road here and where where they meet. Give us three or four key attributes. Uh, you're out. I know you're out recruiting right now. Uh, you have all these great universities here. Give us three or four attributes of your ideal candidate uh, when you're out looking for uh, you know the right sort of people to bring in and make part of the Palantir team. Can we get a mic that works over there? So it's because you have to keep it on the record here. Yeah, grab that one there, Steve. Thank you. That's a very, a very, very difficult question. Uh, well, who is the ideal student? Give us a picture of the ideal no, student. I, I, I'll give you the, uh, the recent picture of an ideal student. We just started hiring from NYU. Um, we've got, I think we've got our first uh, hire in, and there's another one in the, on the way. Um, our CEO likes to call Palantir, and artists call me. Uh, no one here works for anyone. It's a pretty flat organization on paper. I run the UAE business, but I'd be hard pressed to convince anyone to do anything for me in the office, which Danny has visited and has seen, which is a slice of uh, Silicon Valley meets the Middle East. Um, we want people who come here and, as I kept saying, who tell us what to do. Um, we, don't, we don't hire people to come tell, to tell them what to do. We have people who are very mission driven. They are idealistic and we love that about them. They want to go fix the world's hardest problems and we superpower that ambition. Um, be it getting on an aircraft and going to Afghanistan to be deployed at the warfighter in the front lines and, and, and help them or to help COVID response around the world where we offer pro bono our people and our product to uh, almost uh, 100 countries around the world to, to use for COVID response. Um, or the World Food Program where we have uh, we help them with their distribution problem with some of the most um, driven people. Even within uh, artificial intelligence and engineering, we have kids who work as, as privacy and civil liberties engineers, something that is very unique to Palantir. They come in and bring the ethics of AI, the ethics of data integration, the ethics of using that data, and they tell us how to work. Um, so we are looking for people who are mission-driven, idealistic, uh, the round... Uh, the round pegs and the square holes, the ones who are going to tell us what to do. And my, uh, our CEO says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. We see that every single day. Um, our recent hire, uh, Kuteba, is, is one great example of that, that he's incredibly driven and incredibly motivated, and he wants to go fix every single problem that he knows of in the Middle East, uh, and Palantir is going to support him to do that. Uh, and if I tried to get in the way of that, he'd probably kill me. Um, we had a senior uh, Emirati visitor in the office, Danny, you've seen the office, we've, and I walked in with him and was just giving him a tour of the facility and I hear a noise, I turn around and I get shot in the face by a Nerf gun um, and then someone scoots off on a scooter. That student was from NYU and that is the perfect hire. <laughs> a Nerf gun and a scooter, okay. So it's all about work-life balance a little bit too, I think you're saying. <laughs> I mean, if, if work, feels like work, then probably Palantir is not the place for you. Um, there is no work-life balance. It's all the same. Okay. It's a continuum for us. Work, work, work and life are integrated as part of, uh, I those understand. Are, uh, those are exactly the sort of people we attract, and, and those are the people who, who, who hold on to the DNA of who we are. Right, 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 right. Tim, um, we're going to do lightning round, and may then maybe take a quick question. So lightning round for each one of the panels. We'll start with Tim. Um, we're at Expo. We're talking about the future. Um, a, a big takeaway or a big thought or a big idea that you and your company have for what's going to guide us, challenge us, that you're excited about working on for the future. Next five years, next 10 years, please. Yeah. Well, uh, um, the, the thing that excites me the most is, uh, you know, a, a lot of the, the COVID has changed a lot of things and working from home is going to continue. Working remotely is going to continue. And with that, there's a lot of vulnerabilities. So therefore, uh, what excites us is uh, we, what we offer is a 24-hour security operations center. And that's the difference with a lot of companies, uh, uh, a security operations center as a service or a uh, uh, software as a service uh, to, to deploy within your network to monitor your network. Uh, it, you know, we have to be aware that ransomware isn't going away. Ransomware uh, is here to stay. The different variants uh, of ransomware just change every day. We look at the Colonial Pipeline event uh, uh, back in the U.S. Uh, earlier this year in Kaseya, 
And we, the biggest takeaway from those events is, is to remember it's when, when your company is going to get hit, not if it's going to get hit, and you're going to be judged on how you react to the event. So what we do a lot of is a lot of proactive services, and I think if that the biggest takeaway from this is it, instead of being reactive when it comes to cybersecurity, is being proactive and doing stuff on the front end to protect yourself and your, uh, your network and or your company. The comparisons between cyber protection and virus COVID protection, the terminologies, uh, the words are, are interchanged frequently, aren't they? Yeah. Sid. Can I just say something? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So I, I, I totally agree um, with what you said, and also cybersecurity is going to be the challenge of the decade in the sense of an attack is going to take us back. So in reality, the more we are able to secure the data, secure the network, defend all what's happening from an AI perspective and cloud and so on, the more the technology can keep advancing and we can continue to use uh, the, the latest technology. The problem would be a trust. In case really more cyber attacks and started to, uh, to expand across the world, then reality, people will start to be afraid and uh, uh, the, there will be a loss of trust in the new technologies and things will go back a bit backwards. So I totally agree that cybersecurity is an area that uh, everyone needs to be uh, very careful about and consider. Sid, go ahead. Thank yeah, you. I'm going Thank to you. harp on my previous one. Um, we've got a great vision here for the UAE with Project 50, the transition to a knowledge economy. The fact that there's going to be an increased effort in, in attracting and retaining the best and the brightest from around the world. I think for us, Danny, it's, it's what we've talked about. We want to attract and be able to find uh, the best people, and they will have the great ideas um, because there is no one great idea that someone like me can come up with. We will get the best people, and we'll let them go and, and, and come up with the best ideas, and we'll be equal partners in the, in the UAE's vision for that. Sid, but you're too modest. Obviously, Palantir wouldn't have hired you if you didn't have some great ideas also. But Salim, what's your big idea? <laughs> so, um, it's working, right? So, big idea. I, we all know that um, digital now is front and center and is, is going to keep on accelerating. And in this acceleration, there are plenty of opportunities. They will not be become reality because I cover emerging markets and we all know uh, emerging markets have plenty of potential, but who, which country actually makes things happen? We, we're in the UAE that makes things happen, we're lucky. But in general, uh, this is the real challenge. And there is, a, there is the needle, you know, and uh, uh, Alexander is a great needle, you know, a baby crying, no one knows. He had a needle that was poking him, and only the nurse knew that it was a needle. The, the, the needle that's poking uh, emerging markets and this region uh, is policy, is the digital policy. Mm -hmm. If you get them wrong, you will not be able to scale, you will not be able to embrace this, this uh, technology. I'll give you an example. Cybersecurity was, was mentioned. Uh, there's a huge confusion when it comes to cybersecurity, thinking that location gives you security. If I keep my data in country, actually it's secure actually no it's, 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 what really matters is the protection you put around it if you keep it in country you don't have cross-border data flow therefore how will you ever be able to make to, to make international trades and all the, the other good things that come from data sharing at a massive scale what really matters is the protection you put around your data this is just one example of how you can get digital policies wrong and if you get them wrong uh, then you, you really you are going to err and end up in, in the wrong place. And that is the biggest challenge today in emerging markets at large, whether it's in Latin America, Africa, uh, Russia, Turkey, or Middle East and North Africa, uh, and getting them right. Uh, only uh, only the, the winner, I mean, if you want to be in the magic quadrant, uh, a winner, you need to get these right. It's a construction site for policy across emerging markets and the winners are the one who will be getting this right. And I want to say thank you to Google and Microsoft and IBM and other companies on our digital data team that have worked over the last two years to try to help get the UAE's new policy and law that has just come out right. Uh, and we, we work
work the u a e government has worked with all of our american companies in a very collaborative way very very important and setting an example for the future was some do you want to add one big idea or did you get your big idea i think as cyber security as i said the only thing is and it's part of the theme of what we're discussing is the shortage of skills right the the reality the technology research and technology advancement is happening at a much quicker pace and unless we are able to ensure that there is skills that comes hand in hand uh, we will run out of steam and that's 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 the biggest uh, challenge and i see i see that universities communities uh, governments has a major uh, role to play in addition to companies uh, technology companies of course but i think this is uh, something that uh, that is important and needs to be tackled as uh, 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 by by everyone no, I think that's a great segue for you to sum it all up, what he just said, please. Um, I, I think probably the most interesting to me and also the most exciting is the development that nobody expected out of COVID, which is number one, everybody has sort of understood that education around the world is pretty much broken. It's not working. And the second thing that's happened is the is businesses all over the world in different ways in different fields are getting into and engaged in biz in education in ways that never had before and you know it at the risk of being accused of making a shameless plug let me make a shameless plug <laughs> um, you know we are a free service for the individual teachers but 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 we're sponsored by companies uh, big and small, who are interested in promoting uh, a new kind of education paradigm. Uh, just across the street as we were coming in, DP World is interested in launching world-class scholars in the 40 cities where they have ports. Now, they didn't used to be into education like that. And so, uh, you know, my big idea is if you care about the future of education, you got to do something different because what we've got hadn't been working. And I think we're a pretty interesting uh, place and uh, come see us. Uh, we're at the, on the first floor of the women's pavilion. We are the smallest space with the biggest idea. So come <laughs> see us. And probably the most uh, of follow through as well. Ladies and gentlemen, I wanna give you each a chance to meet and talk with and ask your questions personally. So instead of taking a question from the floor, let's give a big round of applause and let you talk to them. Thank you.